after that introduction, I didn't want to start with a confession, but I think I have to. I never really wanted to be a lawyer. I was in pre-med, and I was an activist during the tail end of martial law in the early 80s. And I thought that becoming a lawyer would mean that I would be selling out to the establishment. However, friends who knew me well were telling me, you have to become a lawyer. Because they said I was one, loud, two, argumentative. And so despite my best instincts, I went to law school. And I promptly hated it at first. Until I discovered a type of lawyering that I could really sink my teeth into, that I thought was not a sellout to the establishment. I discovered human rights lawyering. And th that alone in my first year allowed me to be immersed in problems of the urban poor. Teaching them about their rights, the laws affecting them, the constitution. Learning from them while looking out against demolitions. Learning from them property rights and human dignity. In my first year alone, I was exposed to labor law at strike areas and picket lines. And I learned labor law by talking to laborers at labor unions, finding out from them what it meant to be affected by laws of the country affecting employment. I also managed to tag along with some human rights lawyers as they litigated in defense of freedoms. And because of these experiences, I managed to learn a lot about the law. Things that law school did not and could not teach me. Even the law school that taught law in the grand manner. And I discovered that this was the type of lawyering I wanted to do. I discovered that this was the law that I passionately wanted to practice. And so I started out by not wanting to become a lawyer, but I've been a human rights lawyer for close to 22 years now. Today, I want to talk to you about the future. The future of two things that I'm very passionate about. The future of human rights law and the future of legal education. I want to talk to you about two, new, two challenges that confront those two areas. The first is how new technologies will impact on our existing freedoms. And the second is how an event 11 years ago changes or has changed the way we think about our future. Sorry. One reality that we face in the 21st century because of the rise of technology is the intersection between new technologies and ancient rights. Rights that were written into documents that guaranteed those rights even before those technologies were thought of. I want to talk to you about a future where questions are asked where we don't know the answers yet. Questions that involve rights involving free expression, privacy, organization, and assembly. If you're familiar with his book, Philip K. Dick in Minority Report created a world where crime was wiped out simply because of a system of pre-crime investigation, relying on a set of precogs, people who could see into the future, look into the mind of a person who was harboring a criminal intent and have that person arrested even before he could act on that criminal intent. I don't know about the technology that's available, but I would suppose that in maybe the next decade or even earlier, that technology might already be available to us. Now let's take a page from the book and imagine that someone creates an algorithm, an algorithm that would allow a simple security scan, the scan that we, we, we enter into every time we go into a mall, an algorithm that would detect whether a person is a friend or a foe, a person is a good person or a criminal, simply by allowing that person to pass through that scan. What are the implications on that person's right to privacy? Could the government be entitled to arrest that person simply on the basis of a scan that will detect that this person was harboring a criminal intent at that time? How would government weigh the competing interests here? 
the interest of protecting the public from a person who is possibly entertaining a criminal act and catching this person before he actually engages in it and that person's right to privacy, right to be presumed innocent, and right to be protected under the law and the Constitution. What if technological advances in genetic screening would allow a preemptive determination of the criminal tendency of an infant while the infant was still in the mother's womb? Again, what would be the implications on the right to privacy of both the mother and the infant? Would such a preemptive determination, for example, justify con constant surveillance of that infant once it was born until that infant grows and whether the t tendencies detected during that prenatal screening would actually bear fruit. How far could the intrusion go? Could the government or the state tell the parents of that infant, you can no longer conceive any other children because the genetic mix of the two parents having produced a first infant with criminal tendencies would most likely produce another infant with the same criminal tendencies. These are not easy questions to ask, let alone answer. Because these questions confront us with values that we often take for granted and technologies that we sometimes, oftentimes, uncritically accept. One last example. The rise of social media has resulted in a great degree of transparency. Many would argue too much transparency. With some people tweeting and posting Facebook messages for every minute of the day. It has also resulted in the blurring of the line between public disclosure and private information with a right to expect information to be accessible all the time with hardly anything left sacred. What implications would this have on our right to privacy if one fact that we choose to disclose could lead to other facts that could be compelable even if we do not choose to disclose that fact? If by being transparent on one fact, we could be compelled to be transparent in every fact, would that not actually lead to less disclosure and less, in, less uh, transparency in terms of legitimately valuable information? If our disclosures on social media can be mined for data and information without need of securing our personal consent, what implications would this have on our right to privacy? These and other similar questions cannot be answered by just passing new laws or by filing cases in court, which are what lawyers do. One major difficulty of law as a discipline and as a profession is its tendency to isolate and detach itself from other fields. As a result, lawyers look first and frequently only to the law for solutions, not understanding that many questions that they face are not strictly legal questions. They are a mix of many disciplines. Unfortunately, lawyers facing the future, for example, do demand that lawyers must first realize that we don't have all the answers simply because we might not understand exactly what the question asks in the first place. We must learn to understand the question first before we can come up with effective answers. And in that process, perhaps lawyers and those in the uh, legislature would realize that the answers may be found not only in the law, but in other fields and disciplines. It may be found where law would take a back seat and lawyers would not be the primary change agents. Unfortunately, lawyers are not trained to answer questions that straddle ethics, history, philosophy, sociology, psychology, and even engineering. And lawyers, unfortunately, are also not trained to ask for help. The future will almost certainly require lawyers to understand the complexities of other fields, to engage in multidisciplinary discourse and interaction. The future will almost certainly require lawyers to ask for help. For lawyers, it is a humbling experience. Unfortunately, it is a valuable experience and a necessary one if we are to truly face the future. Many of you in this room, as Jigo pointed out at the start, were probably kids 11 years ago when two hijacked planes were turned into missiles and flown into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York 
and two other planes were hijacked and aimed directly at the Pentagon and the White House. 9-11 changed the United States, but it also, in a similar way, changed the world. It changed how we view terrorism and what we need to fight or prevent it. Before 9-11, the playbook was premised on terrorists being geographically limited and ideologically defined. To locate the terrorists, you just needed to put a pin on a map, and to understand them, you just needed to look at the ideology or the belief. Al-Qaeda shattered that paradigm with 9-11. The terrorists that attacked the United States and later bragged about it could no longer be located by simply tacking a pin on a map or be identified by an ideology or belief. They were highly mobile. They were media savvy. They were, net they were network. They were not confined by geographical limitations or ideological belief. Overnight, the rules of the game changed. The view that there were even rules of conduct in war had changed. The view that there were sides, or even just two sides, was completely inapplicable. Even the motivations for their actions were already different. Thomas Friedman wrote that the 9-11 hijackers came from big families, had loving relatives and siblings, one even had a fiancé, but they freely chose to blow themselves and others up in a plane. He described the behavior as indicative of this attitude. Quote, they hate us more than they love their own families. In a very fundamental way, Al-Qaeda did not only think out of the box, they reshaped the box. As a result, the old playbook could no longer work. The hijacked planes, which were turned into missiles, were not only intended to kill civilians and destroy property, they were intended to destroy a particular way of thinking, a particular way of living, a particular way of relating. It was intended to turn the pin on its head and make people doubt fundamental values and virtues such as freedoms, such as liberties, such as tolerance. The attacks were intended to make us ask, should absolute evil be met with absolute good? Or are good and evil just relative values dependent upon context or circumstance, end and means? Should or can a policy or strategy be considered successful if it guarantees a desired result, regardless of what it does to fundamental and principal values that we cherish, such as liberty, such as freedoms, such as tolerance? 9-11 led to policies like racial profiling of individuals, data mining, torture, simply on the basis of a determination that a person was a combatant or was allied with a terrorist group. It also led to a regime of indefinite detention in a place called Guantanamo, which was a bubble where neither American nor international law could penetrate or fundamental guarantees such as freedom, liberty, Judicial review, the right to counsel, the right to human dignity could operate. The 21st century will bring in more, not less, of these questions. Certainly, the law has evolved, evolved as reality has changed. The challenge facing us to ensure that as the law evolves, fundamental guarantees such as freedom, liberty, and tolerance remain absolutes. How do we face the future? We start with the past. We need to start from the way lawyers are trained and taught. I started by confessing that much of what I know and how I think did not come exclusively from law school. We need to look at how law schools teach people. Law schools are traditionally laboratories for training people to practice law. We need to change that. Almost all law schools are obsessed with simply training people to take and pass the bar. We need to change that. An extremely small minority devote time effort and means to, to offer multidisciplinary courses that will produce not only skilled legal practitioners but also deep thinkers and passionate advocates. The law curriculum and the system of legal education needs to be radically changed from its bar orientation to a multidisciplinary approach that will allow people to think, to engage 
with other deep thinkers from philosophy, ethics, sociology, psychology, the arts, humanities, history, engineering, science, and technology. I want to end with this quote, which is found in the wall right behind this wall. It was spoken over a hundred years ago by Oliver Wendell Holmes when he exhorted his law school to teach law in the grand manner. By this, he meant that the law school should go beyond the obvious, the expected, the conventional, the traditional, and the imaginable. This is what teaching for the future of law demands. To not be bound by the inertia of tradition, but to initiate the impetus of change. It is a task that is difficult for lawyers. Why? Because the law is a conservative profession. However, it is a task that is necessary, for it is only by doing so that the aim of a law school, as described by Holmes in that particular statement, may be achieved. That which Holmes describes as not to make men smart, but to make them wise in their calling, and to kindle in many a heart an inextinguishable fire. Thank you very much. Thank you.